I am so excited to have on the podcast today, Shireen Radigan and Tony Floricciardi, who are the co-founders of InEd, the Innovative Educators Network, a grassroots group of education entrepreneurs and innovators in South Florida uh, that now consists of more than 120 micro schools and innovative learning communities serving over 8,000 learners each year. So just an incredible uh, ecosystem of education, entrepreneurship, and innovation in South Florida, and really a beacon for what's possible all across the country. I've had both Shireen and Tony on the podcast separately to talk about their own individual programs. They're both education entrepreneurs. And I wanted them to come on the show today to talk about their collaborative efforts with InEd. Uh, they just hosted their first annual InEd Live conference uh, in mid-January. I was thrilled to be able to present at that event and to be a part of just this group of hundreds of parents, entrepreneurs, policymakers, um, um, innovators, learners uh, at the Museum of Science and Discovery in Fort Lauderdale to talk about what options are available now. And uh, and again, that was just sort of one of the many initiatives that the Innovative Educators Network is working on. So we're going to get into all of that and also hopefully provide some inspiration to those of you listening and watching. If you want to create um, this kind of collaborative community of innovators and entrepreneurs in your neighborhoods. Uh, but before we do that, I'd love for Shireen and Tony to tell us a little bit again about the incredible programs that they run. And so Shireen, let's start with you. You are a former teacher in the Chicago public schools. You also taught in private schools and including a private Montessori school and created a pandemic pod during COVID that then evolved into a full-fledged micro school, Colossal Academy in Fort Lauderdale. And now you're helping others to launch their own Colossal Academies throughout Florida. So tell us a little bit about your program. Sure. So Colossal Academy really aims to be relevant. We find that in our current traditional education system is not centering relevance and it's not centering students. So we really want to make sure that um, young people and families are equipped to have like a seamless transition into adulthood. Uh, we do that by being hands-on um, as much as possible. We're out and about and experiential. One of the many blessings that we have and offer is our partnership with Surfskate Science. So students are able to be out in, in the community and activated um, and active. Um, the other thing that we do as an organization is make sure that our uh, lessons are personalized and make sure that every child works at their own pace and at their own rate. And last, we really center future forward competencies. So we're looking to make sure that the skills that we believe that we that we think young people are going to need moving forward um, are centered. And one of them happens to be entrepreneurship. So a lot of our students have their own full fledged business. Um, and we really, truly believe that a thriving economy is the gateway to a peaceful society. So uh, we're just going to keep contributing and in, in, in that way and having our young people um, enjoy being entrepreneurs. So great. Thanks, Shereen. Tony, you are the founder of Surfskate Science, along with your husband, Yuli. You're homeschooling parents who've long been in the surfboard and skateboard world and decided to create a homeschooling program that also serves microschoolers like those who attend Colossal Academy throughout South Florida to teach uh, STEM subjects, science, technology, math, through action sports. You currently serve over 350 students uh, during the academic year with a long waiting list. Uh, just such an incredible program. You've been featured on the Today Show for um, the wonderful work that you're doing with Surfskate Science. Tell us a little bit more about that program. Yeah, so basically we take a beach or a skate park and turn it into a science lab. So we do a hands-on science lab for about 45 minutes, followed by 45 minutes in the water on a surfboard or on a skateboard in a skate park. They um, are applying things like physics or learning things about chemistry or architecture. Um, we also work on the art aspect. So they're learning about video editing and photography. Um, and then this semester, we're actually learning about how our bodies work while we skate or surf. So we um, take the platforms of action sports and the excitement of action sports and make um, science and technology, engineering, math, art, 
all very practical. Um, we also really love introducing them to careers in those fields and careers that they, they wouldn't think of in those fields. So um, the engineers that go into designing a skateboard shoe or our skateboard helmet or um, or the, the science that goes into farming coral for a coral reef to have a healthy surf break and a healthy ocean. Um, so we do a lot of that. And then also exploring our local habitats, our local oceans, the Everglades, um, all of it's connected. And um, just really getting them outside and having fun and making learning really fun and engaging. So, so exciting. I just love everything that you're doing, running these individual programs, and then also bringing together so many of the education entrepreneurs and aspiring education entrepreneurs in South Florida and really statewide um, to kind of build this community of innovators and, and help share resources and um, support each other as you kind of uh, create the future of learning, or as you call it, Shireen, the education renaissance, which I, I really do believe is is occurring in Fort Lauderdale. You're the, the Florence of today's educational renaissance. Um, so what happened, you know, back in 2021, when you two came together to say, let's start uh, collaborating, let's start building community. I mean, you must have been kind of head down, building your own programs, serving your learners and the families. Uh, in your programs, what was it that inspired you to kind of team up to create the Innovative Educators Network? Who wants to, to well, jump in? <laughs> well, I will tell you, uh, Tony, we see each other on the beach and we're chatting and we're kind of exchanging notes really quickly in between having to teach or be with our students. Um, and so one day, Tony was like, would you want to like go to lunch and maybe invite some other people? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's all get together because we're all in passing, exchanging notes with each other. And so why not just do that over lunch and be together? And um, so it kind of grew. There were four people at our lunch <laughs> at the first meeting and it grew into, I think, maybe 15 people, the second one. And now it's just snowballed. Um, people really see the value in community and it's it, extremely difficult work. Um, entrepreneurship is hard for any any sector of business, but entrepreneurship is extremely difficult because we add the element of families and children. Um, and so we just felt like there needed to be support. We needed to support each other, show up, um, amplify, uh, show some visibility and continue to keep our rosters full so that we are sustainable. And that can look like just a referral, like if my program's not it, I want your child to have the best program possible. So maybe they need to be outside all day. That's my recommendation. You should check out Take Root or maybe just really outside one day. Check out Surf State Science. Maybe homeschooling might be a great opportunity for you. Um, or you're looking for something more classical or Jewish mm -hmm. or Muslim, whatever that looks like for you and your family. And so really, if I'm not the place, I really want young people to be where their hearts are really settled and where families feel really um, like they found the right fit for their for whatever their goals are academically for their children. So um, that's kind of how it started and where where it's it's evolved to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tony, was it was it really as simple as just saying, let's go to lunch and and then it snowballed from there? And how did you kind of grow from the two of you to four to 15 and now to over 120? <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, I will say that um, Shireen's really encouraging and to have somebody there to root you on um, when you're having a hard day as whether it's a, as a teacher or an entrepreneur is really great to have. And then having some some people to bounce ideas off of. We're in an innovative sector. So being able to to ask, have you tried this? Did it work for you? Um, what would you do differently? Learn from others is really important. So uh, yeah, it just started with a few of us and it continued to grow and um, I mean, I was on the phone today with somebody who was struggling with some billing issues for Step Up. And, and that's just, you know, naturally people are calling us and it just makes sense to get everybody in the room so we can have that collective wisdom and we can all say, hey, this worked for me or I'm going through that too. And you just know that you have that support and those people to, to just be there along the journey. Yeah, you just mentioned Step Up, Step Up for Students, one of the administrators of Florida's school choice policies, Florida 
uh, long being a leader in education choice policies, enabling funding to follow students to whatever educational environment best suits their needs. And that program went universal on July 1st of 2023, applying to all K-12 students in Florida. So uh, exciting things happening in Florida and expanding access to a wide variety of options there. So with that first group, I'm just thinking if people are listening and they say, gosh, I'd really, I do feel like I need community. I'd really love to know who else um, is doing this and kind of start to meet for lunch or meet casually. Is it really that you knew kind of these four to 15 initial folks or knew of them? I guess, what are those initial steps that you took and that you'd recommend others take uh, to start building that community and then obviously seeing it grow? I think um, how we found each other was um, Vela at first. I think we were all Vela grantees. And then from that, there, really. yeah, so Vela Education Fund, um, definitely we helped us. Um, we got a small grant from them during COVID and they continued to fund us through different rounds of their grants. And not only the funding, but the support and everything that they do for us. And then they um, created a network so we were able to find people near us that were other Vela grantees. And so that enabled us to reach out to a few different people. And um, that's how it started. Just a few of us that were Vela grantees. And then, um, and then, you know, I might know somebody or Shuri might know somebody or somebody else in the network knows somebody that's starting a program or is struggling with a program that they're doing and just needs some support. And so it just kind of grows word, uh, word of mouth at that point. So I think, well, I first met you uh, both in the fall of 2022, uh, in October of 2022, at Colossal, where you were hosting one of these regular in-ed meetings. And I think at that point, you had more than doubled to over 30 uh, education entrepreneurs. And of course, now you're just, you know, skyrocketing. Um, and really just getting together regularly in different micro schools or different, you know, kind of community spaces to either have a guest speaker or I love that you offer like headshots for founders, some of those sort of professional perks that uh, education entrepreneurs might not be accustomed to. How else are you supporting your local founders? Shereen, I don't know if you want to chime in here. Yeah, so most recently in October, um, James Madison Institute did a, an amazing think tank with us. Um, as we, as July 1st, 2023 passed, the universal savings accounts for um, all students in the state of Florida came with a lot of different um, new problems, right? Every time you solve a problem, there becomes a, a system of new problems that you need to solve. And so part of it was just like, what needs to actually be legislated as we're moving forward and what needs to be problem solved just within like being in community or finding the ways around certain things, right? Um, without needing to go to, to uh, present a, you know, a bill or uh, go up to Tallahassee and support a bill or do lobbying or any of the other pieces. And what, what do we have control of that's in our hands right now? And really, what do we need to uh, really urge and stress for more, for more help? So that was a big uh, meeting. I know a lot of us were charged with um, big emotions <laughs> as we were, as, as the funds were being released at, um, what seemed at the time to not be transparent. So a lot of us were ready to go to Tallahassee, right? But really we found that just maybe having a meeting with Step Up, which we did then in November and December, um, uh, as the organization was able to say, these are what we're dealing with. Please help us on your end because we're not a public school or a private school or any of these um, more traditional learning models. This is what we are. And so we were able to really take what we learned from JMI, James Madison Institute, and apply it right away to um, asking for a meeting. And that was really beneficial. Um, you know, we're also just, some of it is just celebrating and showing up at each other's open houses. Like it's really difficult in South Florida to find space. So if you find space, we should all be celebrating. And um, that just means that, you know, we know what it takes to get space. We know how hard it is and how difficult it is to open your doors for the first day. So we show up and that's really just it. There's not much more to that except for, hey, did you guys know there's an open house? We blast it out and people show up. They send their flowers and then, you know, 
we hope for more to happen. So those are kind of on the other, like one more organized and some just community building that we um, we found have been really beneficial in, in the network. Yeah, so bringing, you know, connecting with policy advocates, um, people who can kind of be in your corner, like uh, James Madison Institute, um, work figuring out how to work with other sorts of organizations that are helping to implement and execute these school choice policies. That's a key uh, role that in-ed plays. Tony, what else? How else are uh, are you all supporting education entrepreneurs and would-be education entrepreneurs in South Florida? So I, I do love that we um, were able to have um, what he labels himself as a serial entrepreneur that's very connected in Broward County come in and talk to us about burnout and what it looks like to balance your life as an, an entrepreneur. So that was wonderful. Um, just things like that. And just really honestly being able to know that you have a network of people that you can text if you need something and not just um, business wise, but personally, Hey, I'm having a really hard week. Can you help me out with this? Or do you have a teacher that could step in here for me? Um, also, we also have this, amazing um shireen calls it uh, the you know the micro schools being the soup and us all, all us other programs being the spices and so you have this eclectic group of educators um that you're able to pull from so even though you have a micro school that might not have all the programming that a big school would have we have this tremendous amount of resources and people that you can bring in and experts you can bring in so um, that also makes it a really great network. Um, we're able to collaborate on things like science fairs or graduations or dances. And it's, it's been really wonderful. So even though we're smaller schools, it feels like we're so much bigger. And can I brag on something really quick? Yes. We also had a conference. I was going to prompt you to talk about that too, right? We had a conference. Yeah. Because as if you weren't busy enough, you decided to put on this amazing conference, bringing together hundreds of people. Tell us about that, Shireen. Well, to this is definitely something that was out of my comfort zone. Uh, and Tony was like, I think we should have a conference. And how it led, how we led to that is that visibility is a, a pillar of what we offer at in ed. So we really want to make sure people know about all these amazing programs. And in order to do that, we have to have fairs or we have to have meetings, but we also found that as CEOs of our own company that we, we traveled a lot. And when we travel, we leave our children. And so Tony was like, wouldn't it be great if we had a conference where kids could attend? And I'm like, yeah, that would be awesome. She's like, let's do it. And I'm like, oh, I think it, so anyway, Tony's amazing at um, really just spearheading these very amazing big ideas. And so we did. We had a conference um, that day. There were over 1,500 people that we impacted through um, not only just visibility. We had entrepreneurs there. We had three lanes of um, programming, one for just parents, like how to parent in this new era that could look like breathing techniques as well mm -hmm. as what are your options for high school and dual enrollment. Um, we had a lane for entrepreneurs, um, SPN State Policy Network and James Madison Institute had a working lunch for our entrepreneurs, as well as um, uh, Stand Together's uh, Catalyst program. They had a, a, a program for uh, principal-based mm -hmm. management. Mm -hmm. And so then our entrepreneurs could have a working lunch and then there was a track for young people. So that looked like uh, speaking, uh, how do you public speak or dancing and movement? And we have an Olympian uh, on our, in our, in ed uh, members, and he teaches about like movement and connection. And so there was, there was tracks for different people and it was held at a museum um, so that families could attend and still be a part of uh, not only raising their business up, but also seeing what options are available. And, um, we kicked off National uh, School Choice Week that way. Yeah, it was just phenomenal to see. And I'm glad that you're planning the second annual uh, in-ed live conference next January. So looking forward to uh, details about that. So it sounds like, and you, you've alluded to this already, it's very collaborative, right? Like we often think about 
um, you know, various markets as being competitive and sort of people vying for the same customers. And it doesn't seem that way at all, either in uh, South Florida or elsewhere. Frankly, when I meet with education entrepreneurs across the country, I see the spirit of community and collaboration. I don't think that that's anywhere as apparent as it is in South Florida, which is just tr truly leading the way um, in terms of the numbers of entrepreneurs and families served and also in the spirit of collaboration that you've cultivated. Why do you think that is? Why is it not competitive? Uh, and why is it so collaborative where you are? I mean, I think that we are so diverse and all of us are reaching a different group. And the number of homeschoolers, microschoolers, and people just looking for different options continues to grow. So I don't think there's any shortage of customers, um, but I do think we're offering all unique things. But as a network, we're all facing similar challenges, even though we're different. So, um, so collaboration is just natural. I mean, we're all juggling challenges and we're all trying to spearhead new ideas. Um, we're all trying to navigate you know, our city policies and how do we open up a space if we have it or how do we navigate South Florida real estate? So um, we're, all, we're all up against the same challenges, but we all have unique visions. So I kind of see it as, you know, we're a body with a bunch of different parts working together and we're all unique. And, and I shouldn't try to be the same as Shireen. Shireen shouldn't try to be the same as us. Instead, if we work together, we're able to complement each other um, and do better things together. And so um, that's kind of the whole inspiration for the Innovative Educators Network. I just remember hearing years ago, this African proverb that you could go faster alone or you could go further together. And I just really believe as a community that we can do so much more together. And I just wanna see our community impacted through how we're all educating and um, the ways we're pouring into this next generation. And I know Shireen feels the same way. And, um, and that's how we're gonna do it as working as a team. Yeah, it's just such an inspiration. Uh, and I just love that you focus on the diversity of these different options, because there really is something for everyone. And that's growing more and more apparent as more entrepreneurs create new models that families can find just the right fit aligned with their distinct individual needs and preferences. Um, and it's just beautiful to see that emergence. And then the fact that you're referring each other to different programs. I think, Shereen, you talked a little bit about this before. You say, like, well, you might not be right for my program, but have you looked into this program? And this is something I see happening uh, all across the in-ed network and in other areas where there are similar networks across the country. What do you think, Shereen? Why, why do you feel like this kind of spirit of collaboration is so apparent uh, in South Florida? Well, I think that the movement that's happening here is ran and led by women and mothers and teachers. And I think generally speaking, uh, I'm gonna declare that I believe <laughs> naturally parenting is quite collaborative. And when you're in a community, I think the spirit of education is actually quite collaborative. And now that teachers are involved in deciding the fate of whatever is starting to um, evolve in education, we're collaborative. That's how we. That's how we pass the day. We pass each other uh, lesson plans. We pass each other great notes for things that we found out, or a YouTube clip, or whatever is going to to pack our arsenal so that we can um, really deliver what whatever is best for the young people, as well as just continue to amplify our skills. Um, so I think that there's there's two parts. I, I do think that this ideation of education um, is not a top down approach, and I think that that. <clears throat> hasn't worked for many people and instead it's like really from the ground up <laughs> which I mean there's no pun intended we are working on a film called that though too but I think part of it is really that the spirit of education itself is very much collaborative and that mm. is coming through um, I also just think that we're conscious of the fact that sometimes jealousy creeps in and it's okay to feel jealous that someone's a year ahead of ahead of you or that and then we just talk about it and we discuss it and we put it out on the table and we're vulnerable with each other like I felt that before too or I have also worried am I good enough or I've also not known how to do this and then just hearing those stories has helped um, ease other people during their vulnerable moments I love it 
So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk more generally about entrepreneurship. Uh, the why and the how. And so I'd love to start uh, maybe back to you, Shireen, and then we'll go to Tony. What is your why? Why do you feel so um, embracing of entrepreneurship? Yeah, I feel like it is the most freeing uh, process that I have ever been through. It's the most difficult process, including uh, above parenting. <laughs> it is the most difficult process, but I feel like it is it's forging the most beautiful uh, expression of myself. I feel like uh, the entrepreneur way is is like a roller coaster, and you learn to manage uh, your feelings and you grow on on many different levels. Um, so you know, I think that that is probably my why is like I just love to seek. Freedom, first of all, I love to be free. Less limits, the better. Like, <laughs> why would I do your program when I could just make my own, right? Like, that's always just kind of been my internal. I'm I'm a creative as well. Um, I generally enjoy creating things and making um, and, and being a problem solver. It's kind of the engineering self within me. Um, and yeah, so I think that, you know, entrepreneurship is the synthesis of that. And then also, you know, my mom was a, as a teacher, I'm a fifth generation educator. My dad's a truck driver, third grade education. Um, and I want legacy and I want something that's more permanent and I want to accumulate wealth. And I don't know that. And, and I'm an educator. So I couldn't do that within the system. I couldn't own my classroom. I didn't have anything to trade or sell. And that um, this is something that could be sold at some point and then I could pass on to my children as a, as a form of wealth. And so that, that is another probably why I've said a lot of whys, but those are probably the, the culmination <laughs> of the three. Yeah. This is a pursuit of personal and economic freedom. Uh, it seems like that is a why for you. What about for you, Tony, what is your why when it comes to being an entrepreneur? Um, I definitely think for surf skate science, um, there were two main reasons why we started it. One is um, there was a tremendous need in our community. Um, our community went through a school shooting. Um, we, um, a lot of the kids had grown up skateboarding in a skate park we ran at a private school and um, our community just needed us. So um, the schools were closed and the idea to get them out surfing or skateboarding just naturally happened because that's what we did. That was who we are as a family. And as schools continue to be closed after uh, for a few months after the shooting, um, we added in the science aspect. I went to school for ocean engineering and I love science and um, writing curriculum was something I did at the private school. So I was like, why don't we just take this to the beach and get these kids outside talking to each other instead of being isolated in their grief and dealing with that. So that was one reason. Um, the second reason was my kids. I have three kids. And as a mom, you know that all your kids are different and unique and they all learn different ways. Um, but I have two boys that are skateboarders and they did not sit still. They couldn't sit still. They needed to learn by um, doing, seeing, feeling, touching, tasting things. And so I created something that worked for them, that worked for most skateboarders or surfers that we knew that had a problem sitting still. So that was our why. I just really felt like every kid needed to see their potential, um, especially after everything that happened at Stoneman Douglas, to see that they were here for a purpose and to find that purpose and pursue it. Um, we weren't planning on starting a business, but um, I definitely have that entrepreneurial bug. I've always had that love being creative, um, just like Shereen said, and the engineer in me <laughs> to just creating things. Um, but it wasn't, we didn't set out originally to do that. We just knew that we had to do something for our community. It's really powerful, Tony. I wonder if you think of other whys of members of your network uh, beyond some of the things that you and Shireen have talked about. What are some of the other reasons that you see local entrepreneurs starting micro schools, homeschooling programs, learning pods, platforms, all sorts of uh, innovative solutions? So I can teach, I can speak from the teacher side for people who have been a traditional teacher or in any kind of teaching that isn't the innovative ed style of teaching. Um, <clears throat> we knew what we went into education for and what we ended up doing while we were in education did not reflect 
what was kind of sold to us or what our imagination was, right? And so um, if you're brave enough, then you go create your own and and find the space and create the space that is going to allow you to be the best possible educator uh, or administrator or however, whatever your role was at, at the schools that you were before. And so I know that a lot of people are really wanting to fully express their, their um, and actualize with their, as educators and really own their classroom and not have to deal with um, somebody telling them outside how to manage their classroom when we are literally in front of the kids and know exactly what the students need. Um, and so a lot of the top-down mandates have not, don't work. They don't work because they're made by people who aren't actually in the classroom or haven't been in a classroom in a long time. Um, so I think that that's part of it. And I think just freedom for some people, it's the freedom um, uh, to be able to teach what you want to teach, right? And that could be whether that's religious and values or um, a curriculum that um, is dynamic and 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 uh, shows indigenous people or black history uh, or explores different uh, backgrounds for um, uh, people who are LGBTQI, right? So some of people are creating safe spaces for them to explore that kind of curriculum and some are creating spaces so that they can continue to um, spread what they believe are their values, right? And that could be across the board religiously, whether it's Muslim, Jewish, uh, Christian. Um, yeah. I just love that I also think, educational pluralism. Yeah, Tony, what were you gonna add? Yeah, I also think that um, as Shereen said, it's you know definitely a parent driven thing as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all just trying to serve our own families as well. And, and in doing that, there's families similar to ours. So whether you have a kid that has special needs or is challenged with ADHD or, um, or you know, is a tremendously gifted kid that loves robotics or, you know, our trade, you're able to do that and find what works for your family. And I think that is driving a lot of parents to actually start programs as well. Mm. So exciting. You know, you said something, Shereen, you said, if you're brave enough, you create your own. I actually think, well, I think that's true, first of all, but I would also say, I think that it's groups like in ed that help instill that bravery, uh, especially in people who might be a little bit more wary to take the leap into entrepreneurship. But when they feel like they're a part of a larger community of entrepreneurs, people who've done it before, they gain more of that confidence to go forward. Is that the sense that you're getting from, from some of the founders in your network? Yeah, I, at the quarterly meetups, we will, and that's a general open invitation. And we find that there are people who are interested in maybe starting a mm -hmm. micro school, or I really would love to do like therapies, you know, and they'll come and they'll find that they are a part, right? And, and become members. And then they yeah, eventually open their own school. And this has happened several times where I've just been like, you were just having, you know, celery and ranch with us. And now look at your school, right? And so <laughs> I think that that uh, having, having a space for people to feel like they could venture into or get a peek into what would be the future absolutely gives some more safety to, to making those leaps. Um, you know, courage is not something that is without fear you can still be afraid and, and use your courage and um, hopefully if you see more examples which is why I love what you do Carrie honestly I know I'm going to throw it back to you but I really love what you do because people need to see examples of what is possible and people that are doing work that might be similar or have not even similar and that they're successful or sometimes we fail right and that the what what can we learn from the failures um, and so by you amplifying um people's stories i think is so incredible and it's uh, you know in the same vein of what tony and i are doing of making sure visibility is is possible not just for the people who who need to you know sell a, a, a spot at their school or a surfboard or whatever that looks like but really visibility as in like we are here <laughs> we're here don't be afraid we're all here yeah, I think that's true, that, that sort of storytelling, the social proof, providing the examples. But at the end of the day, it still is a leap to be an entrepreneur. There's still that inherent risk. That's why it's not easy to do. It's not why it's why not everyone does it, um, because you do have to kind of venture into some unknown 
places and assume some risks that you might not otherwise do if you were working for someone else. And so uh, it's just great to see more of that entrepreneurial spirit emerging in South Florida, thanks in large part to your work. So Tony, if that's the why, what about the how? You know, what are what are some of the recommendations that you have for uh, entrepreneurs thinking about hanging up their shingle and opening, launching something new? You know, what are, after sort of seeing so many entrepreneurs in your network, what are some of your key uh, how-tos to get started? So um, I think my first thing I would suggest to anybody is don't be afraid to think big. Um, Just, you know, just to have, you know, those wild ideas and, um, and just play with different innovation, you know, different innovative ideas that, you know, what if, what if I could do this? I think that's the first thing. And then I think it's just taking, just putting one foot in front of the other and just not, not stepping back, just continuing to move forward in that dream that you have. Because I do think anything's possible if you put your mind to it. And I think that we need those crazy big ideas for the future that we're going to have. And I think we need to inspire a generation of kids to really think big as well. So, Well, and you're practicing what you (laughs) preach too, not only obviously with the huge impact you're having with Surf Skate Science, but then with this conference, which was a big undertaking, you know, really a bold (laughs) vision. And it was just phenomenal. And you're going to do it again next year. So uh, I love that idea. Think big. Uh, We need those bold ideas. And you're certainly uh, showing that's possible. What do you think, Shireen? What are what are some of your initial how tos for someone just wanting to get going? Yeah, I would look at for maybe a program that's already kind of doing something similar. You know, there are a lot of people helping people to start micro schools. Colossal's doing that. Um, yeah, tell us a little people. bit about yours. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're franchising. I think that's the best, quickest way into the to, into the market. We thought that. Um, it would minimize the amount of stress and time that people are spending on it starting. Um, that's the way that Colossal is, uh, is choosing to help people start off. There are other, there are all types of people that are helping with micro schooling, whether it's just consultations or programs, KaiPod is doing something. I, you know, Acton has their models as well. Um, and Prenda. So there are lots of different people out there doing the work to help people through it. But the other piece is, you know, uh, Vela was a huge, uh, like a, a huge feather in the cap for me and just validating uh, and having permissionless um, funding, like have a wild idea, go try it out and and here's some funding to go try it out. And that helped soften the, that can take a, somewhat of a parachute while you're jumping off the cliff to feel like I could try innovative things. And so I think at the Mm -hmm. time I was really interested in building out a mobile classroom out of a bus. And um, that gave me the the push I needed to buy a bus, which led me to be able to take my kids to serve skate science, which led me to be able to do a lot of different things. We didn't have a, in the end, we didn't have a mobile bus. What we ended up having was um, a whole full classroom. Mm -hmm. So, but um, you know, reaching out and looking at Vela um, as a, as a wonderful resource uh, as well as just the network that they provide besides the funding that is massive just to see other people again. And, um, and, you know, counting uh, one thing I say to people is if the vision was gifted to you, it's because it's yours to see it through. Like the vision that you were given Carrie to have these amazing podcasts and do all the things that you do is not the vision I had. Right. But we're part of the same, um, network and the same fabric and the same, you know, tapestry, but it was gifted to you for you to see it through and that everybody's vision is going to be different and that to trust and lean into your vision, um, as a gift for you to, to see through. I love that. So that's I would a- say, I would say one more thing too, is to, yeah. um, to not listen to the naysayers, you know, to really, um, really believe that yeah if this is your vision for something and you really believe in it don't worry about um, other people who say you know I don't think that's going to work um just keep pursuing it because I do really believe if you're given a vision that and you're called to do something that you need to continue to pursue that love that So as we sort of begin to wrap up, I'd love to circle back a little bit to the how-to of creating an entrepreneur community. You talked a little bit about how you started in ed. I hear from 
uh, founders periodically that will say, gee, I'd love to know who else is doing this in my area. I'm not aware of other people, or I do feel like I'm an island, uh, but I know that there has to be others around. So what recommendations do you have for those uh, solo entrepreneurs who are looking to create a community who have as a template in ed uh, as their bold vision, but what would you say should be some of their initial steps? I would, if it were, if I were in the middle of nowhere and I really felt like I was alone, I would mm. start to Google what other programs that I just think are really cool, interesting. And then I would probably write the director. That, that would be my steps. I would write and say, I really love your program. I think it's super cool. I have my own thing going on. Would you want to get lunch sometime? Mm. I probably love would that. start like that. Um, <laughs> I love, this is what you're doing. I don't know if you've seen the I don't know if you've seen these things that are going on and I would love to just be in community and collaborate if it's possible. And they might say no, and that's okay. But that I would probably find things that inspire me um, as far as what, what people are executing and doing and just reach out. Amazing. Tony, what would you say? And I would say too, if you couldn't find them on Google, um, you could go on Facebook. There's tons of homeschool groups in your area. Um, I mean, pretty much every town has a group, a mom's group of some kind and start asking, is anybody else doing any educational programming or are there homeschool parents here that are, are doing little pods, you know, can we get together? So I think, um, and then if you, you know, and if you come to a dead end there, you can always reach out to Vela Education Fund and ask, are there any entrepreneurs in my area? Um, so there's, there's multiple ways. I wouldn't say um, just give up if you can't find a Google search if you're in a rural area. Um, and even if it's just one or two of you, it's still a community. So just start small and hopefully it will grow from there. Yeah, and I'll say that in, in addition to kind of building up that entrepreneur support network that can come from a, a network like Ined, there's also these deep friendships that form, right? Just from reaching out, like you said, Shereen, <laughs> yeah. reaching out to someone saying, hey, you want to grab lunch or uh, putting a, a post on a Facebook group saying, anyone else out here want to get together just leads to some really incredible friendships and connection that goes beyond, um, you know, kind of your day-to-day -day entrepreneur work. Do you find that as well? Yes, I say Tony and I are Lucy and Ethel. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're <laughs> so I'll send her gifts all the time of like them eating chocolate and trying to <laughs> that's kind of what leading up the in ed was like oh we got it to the live conference but um yeah you know first I thought it was like Thelma Louise and I was like I don't like it because they go off a cliff and they die we're more <laughs> like Lucy and Ethel and we we just do fun crazy things and um get into some trouble in the good ways and and yeah I, I definitely have deep friendships with um within um, the network. There are people that I can really rely and count on if I needed to drop my daughters off for any reason, or if I really mm -hmm. needed something. Um, I know that there, there are a handful of people that I could really genuinely count on. And we go to each other's graduations and birthday parties and, and uh, on a personal note, make sure that everybody, you know, that our families are in, in community as well. Just incredible. Okay, so in the spirit of bold visions, what is your bold vision for the future of the Innovative Educators Network? Uh, what do you hope to see come in the coming years and uh, months and years? So um, Shireen's been spearheading this film called From the Ground Up, I'm really excited about. And it talks about, um, you know, the movement coming from moms from the ground up and what's going on here in South Florida and around the U.S. So um, that's something that's very exciting. It is amazing. And um, definitely we plan to do a future conference and then hopefully to see more innovative educator networks or even networks similar to it around the U.S. that empower others to start educational entrepreneur businesses. Yeah, and you said you're you're happy to sort of connect with others who want mm -hmm. to do something similar to Ined, uh, either by kind of showing them what you've done or you know helping them think through how to get to get started, create their own Ined network where they are. Uh, I think that's that's such a great uh, service that might be appealing to some people listening. I wonder what you think, Shireen, about the kind of bold vision for the future of Ined. Yeah, I really see us having a seat at the table, uh, whether we are helping to improve uh, in-system 
um, learning and that we can be an example of how to uh, do education differently. So not everybody's going to homeschool or micro school. And there are going to be a lot of people that still need and rely on childcare that the traditional education system offers. I see us having a seat at the table and showing what are possible even within system, right? That we can innovate even within system um, and that INED would be helping to, to uh, create those bridges. Just incredible. So the website for INED is innovativeeducatorsnetwork.com. Tell us how we can also find out more about each of your individual programs that you run. Tony, start with you. Yes. So, um, so our program, you can find us at surfskatescience.com or on social media at surfskatescience on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we even have TikTok and, and X, so you can <laughs> find us on there. Um, and then, um, yeah, you can connect with us on our website. Shereen, what about you with Colossal? Sure. Our website is colossal-academy.com and we are on Facebook. <laughs> we are on LinkedIn. We are on X. I haven't really, you know, I haven't, I haven't figured that part out um, yet, but we are on the social media platforms. Um, yeah. So please feel free if you want to reach out, if you want to start your own Colossal, but you know, really in ed um, is, is where it's at for, for growth and in collaboration. So great. And again, that's innovative educators network.com. And you can also uh, see the trailer to the From the Ground Up documentary film, which is just spectacular. So uh, just wonderful to connect with you. So amazing to see what you're building. Shireen Radigan and Tony Floricciardi, best wishes to you. And thank you for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie.